Hello everyone, my name is Lee and welcome to How Do DM, the new series where we're going to talk about all of my mistakes I made as a new DM so you don't have to. Today we're going to be talking about probably the single biggest mistake that I've ever made as a DM, uh, and that is session prepping. Now, as many of you are probably already aware, session prep is an instrumental tool in any DM's routine. Taking into account what happened in the last session and then utilizing those events to prepare for the next is something that occurs, or at least should occur, uh, between each session. <laughs> And while it might be the most consistent task that any DM has in their routine, it can also be one of the most frustrating and intimidating tasks. But first, let's start with a story. Once upon a time, there was a wee lad who sat at his older cousin's D&D table. When he spoke, he made everything seem so immersive, the way the world moved around the players, right down to the silly song the goblin sang about stealing and eating people. The way he made the world come to life inspired something within that boy, and eventually, that wee lad wanted to try his own hand at DMing a campaign. Spoiler alert, that wee lad was me, and I was probably about 16 years old, so realistically, I really wasn't much as a wee lad as I was a wee man. Yeah, I'm gonna cut that out. Anyways, long story short, I started DMing a few campaigns and have recently become exposed to a wonderful world called Critical Role, so I decided to make a completely new homebrew campaign setting. This homebrew campaign is one that I call The Legend of the Laylight, and it holds a special place in my heart. Not only because it was my first campaign that I'd ever written, but because honestly I learned so damn much. Now, I'm gonna put up my old session notes on the screen here, so to see if you can figure out what I'm talking about. If you haven't already guessed, there are a lot of notes in there, probably more than any DM could possibly ever remember. But being the new, excited DM that I was, I definitely put a lot of my excitement and eagerness into that session prep notes. Don't get me wrong, being prepped for a session is definitely a good thing, but let's take a deeper look into my notes to see what I'm talking about. The first thing that you might notice is that the entire first page is all descriptions and RP, aside from the combat that happens between here. Now you might be saying, Golly gee, Mr. Lee, this is a first session, so shouldn't there really be a descriptive intro like you have here? To which I say, right you are, little Jimmy. So here's the reason we're going to skip ahead and go to my session three prep notes. Do you see a pattern here? Since I was a relatively new DM, I didn't feel like I had the confidence to be able to improv successfully depending upon what kind of checks or decisions that they made. So I kind of tried to account for every single possibility, and if you're a DM and you've been a DM for a while, you know that's kind of impossible. Not to mention that it is incredibly time consuming, and if you keep up this level of detail in your prep time, you are going to get burnt out super fast. Another level of this is, what if the players don't go to the orc village? What if instead they skip ahead to session 5 and head straight for my town Longmeadow? Well, now I had spent literally hours on one section and have nothing prepared where they want to go, and when the players inevitably did pick that option, I panicked and pretty much had nothing for them to go off of once they got to the village. It was just an empty village with nothing but Bill the Barkeep and Quinn the Town Guard. But you know what? In that panic, I decided that Quinn might be a young man who is new to the guards, and he's decided to become a guard to protect his family, even though he might not be the most brave individual. A sole guard stands in front of you with a spear in one hand, and as you approach, stammers nervously, Wait, please don't go inside yet. I, I, I mean, Halt, who are you? And just like that, while Quinn might have been a no one beforehand, he single-handedly saved that entire session because I roleplayed him like a big, lovable idiot and was just trying to do the right thing. I bring this up because it showcases that no matter how hard or how much you prep, the players will almost always find a way to completely circumvent the prep in lieu of something else that you did not prepare for. In this instance, my party skipped the orc village entirely and opted to go straight to the new village. And because of my rigid prep notes that I had, I was kind of pressed to come up with something on the spot. And this is kind of where I really started to gain a better understanding of something. Improvisation. In my opinion, it is the single most important tool to any DM. The ability to read the player's movements in real time and adjust accordingly is a hallmark of an experienced DM. But how does this all pertain to session notes? I'm glad you asked. Let's pull up some of my old session notes and then compare them next to my newer session notes with my D&D livestream campaign. Now, allow me to preface this by saying that neither of these styles of prep notes are wrong. There is no right way to prep for your sessions and every DM has their own preferred style, some more in depth than others. My latest style of prep notes is kind of a culmination of confidence gained from the lessons throughout my years as a DM, and I quickly found out that my early style of prepping was burning me out, which kind of brought me to my newer style that you see before you. 
And that leads me to the main point of this video, which is how to get the most out of your prep notes. Generally speaking, the reason my notes are much more concise is in bulleted list is because I understand everything about the world because I built it. Just kidding, I don't know everything about the world. It's literally impossible to know every single person and every single shop in your world. And before you say something about Matthew Mercer, I ask you to find an episode where he does not refer to his intensive notes. Please don't take that the wrong way and think that I'm calling Matthew a bad DM because I'm actually saying quite the opposite. The guy is a genius when it comes to engaging his players and making an awesome game. What I am saying is that I'm not Matt Mercer, you're not Matt Mercer, you are your own independent DM who don't need no Mercer effect. Look, my point is that even if the party investigated something that I did not build yet, I had enough of an understanding or a foundational understanding of my world to make logical conclusions of what could happen when they got there. My thoughts are that 95% of effective prep work is having a solid foundation of your world. I might not know every single NPC in Mooncliff, but I understand the city and have a great idea of what life is like there. This understanding allows me the freedom to create things on the fly that I might not have necessarily prepared since I understand the environment in which the players are at. If you see my eyes darting left and right, I'm sorry, I'm also reading from a script. I'm trying to get better at that. <laughs> the party wants to search for a flower shop in town? Well, <laughs> I'll be damned if I have that prepped. But what I do know is that Mooncliff is an affluent town situated near a river in the shadows of the River Hill Mountains to the west. So I can kind of ad-lib a shop based upon that information. If you made a homebrew campaign setting much like a Sora or Wild Mount on Critical Role, you should already have a pretty good understanding of what's going on in the world anyways. And if you're reading a module, I suggest you read the entire book. Think about it like this, the beginning of the story is point A and the ending of the story is point B. If you haven't read the ending, then you're missing point B completely. If that's the case, you're trying to guide your players from point A to point B becomes impossible because point B doesn't exist yet. Now there can be multiple different endings, you can insert points C, D, E, F, and G, you can have a true open world D&D campaign, but while your world may have different endings and potential plot points with every module, uh, it has an overarching plot line. Otherwise, it wouldn't be much of an adventure so much as it would be kind of like Minecraft with no real goal in sight. If you've watched our livestream show Behold This Crit, then you might have seen the episode where the party has a couple of options that they could make. Minor spoilers for episode 5 or something. Um, but essentially, the Wardens and the Templars of Respite have a few potential plot hooks which I will list out. They can investigate cultists, investigate ogres in the Southern Plains, uh, guard the town of Aerofall, find a little girl, uh, find a bad guy's whereabouts, or procure a bottle of Autumn's Breeze, which I think the party completely ignored. Placing options in front of the party opens up multiple different paths the story can take, and you can never completely guess where the players might go and what decisions they might choose. This right here, this six different paths to take, is the reason for my style of prep notes. While I might not have every single detail about every single plot hook planned out, I do have bullet points of information about what might happen depending upon where the players might go. One of the hallmark skills of a experienced DM is being able to gently guide the players rather than strictly railroad them into a session or a story that they might not necessarily want to jump into. While each of the plot hooks that I listed is not necessarily directly connected to the main plot, they are still ways that I could connect it later on down the line. And if the party chooses a direction that you weren't expecting, you can always create your own downtime after the session. Uh, and if you need to, during the session, you can always call for a short break. This will allow you a little bit of free time without the player staring at you waiting for you to continue the adventure. Okay, so I've berated you enough about the why, let's talk about the how. Like I said earlier, there is no right way to prep for a D&D session since everyone has their own style and way of doing it. So I'm just going to go over what I do and hopefully that helps. So generally, whenever I'm preparing for my next session, I kind of take a step back and see where the story might potentially be going. Uh, then I take a few things that might happen and make their own sections or bullet points. For example, what you see on the screen right now. Let's say those are the four things that I expect to potentially happen in the next session. The next thing I need to do is make sub bullets of what might happen if the party interacts with each of those potential plot hooks. Now taking a look at these, do you remember what I said earlier? One of the hallmarks of an experienced DM is being able to gently guide the players rather than railroading them. You might have noticed that each of these bullet points can connect to one another some way. This may seem like railroading, however, think about it from the player's perspective. 
if they decide to investigate the bandits, they'll find a kidnapped child, which will lead them to the town guard. Uh, then they might hear rumors about people sneaking around and then ask the tavern owner uh, and then interact with the bad guy, Jerry. To us, it looks like this. But we have the full story. From the player's perspective, it looks more like this. Being a DM is like a balancing act between knowing enough to keep the players engaged with the story, but not overwhelming yourself with information. And this is a great way to practice that. While each of these plot hooks technically lead to the same outcome, the road the party took to get to that outcome can differ. For example, maybe they ignore the rumors completely and head straight to Larry'sville to return the letter. Then instead of this, it will look something like this. Or maybe they go to the tavern first and hear about a missing child. Then it might look something like this. Do you see what I'm getting at here? And please take this all with a grain of salt because this is an extreme example for the sake of the video's explanations just because it exemplifies the points I'm trying to make. This is essentially a very oversimplified example of how to keep your players engaged with the story but to keep up the illusion of a completely sandbox world. And to an extent, it is completely sandbox, because regardless of what the players do, I can always make something else for them to do. And if they do completely go off the beaten path and go somewhere I was not expecting at all, that's fine too, because I can always workshop it out in my downtime and then find a way to connect it to the bigger picture after. Just remember, your job as a DM is to keep the players engaged and with the world around them and keep them excited to explore it all. And just because you don't know something, make sure that you never admit it to the players. One of the cardinal sins of being a DM is admitting to the players that you don't know. If you admit that that NPC has no name, you're essentially admitting that he's not important to the story, and as soon as you do that, you break the illusion and the players are thrust back into reality with their minimum wage job in the global pandemic. If the DM doesn't know the name of this NPC, he must not have anything to do with the quest, so let's just leave and search for the quest giver. At that point, why not just tell the players that Jerry is a quest giver? Now here's the secret. If you can maintain composure instead of panicking and do this one simple thing, it's a super duper hidden technique passed down from DMs to DMs for generations. And I like to call it the search and shuffle. If you don't know the answer to something or you weren't prepared for a question that the players might ask, simply shuffle through some papers and say it's in my notes somewhere and I'll get back to you. That's it, that's the big secret. Because saying that it's somewhere in your notes means to the players that that nameless NPC is written down somewhere, meaning that he might actually be important later on down the line, even if the nameless NPC wasn't written down at all. Doing this helps your players feel like it's a world rather than a movie. Like Lord of the Rings, for example. We follow Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Frodo, all of those good guys. But what about the people that live in those poor towns? What about all the people from Rohan that had to move to another city? What about those people? They have names, but do we know any of them? No, we don't. This isn't a movie, it's a story that the players are the main characters of. So while we might not have seen Legolas or Aragorn interact with those people in that scene, they were actual people. So think about it from that perspective there. Well, hopefully me rambling on has helped you in some way. I know I kind of took a roller coaster, but I just kind of talked for the hell of it. And then hopefully it kind of comes full circle in the end. Um, but anyways, if you do have any questions about the session prepping or how I do my notes, or if you just have any questions about how you might want to do your notes or how I can help, please let me know in the comment section below. I would greatly appreciate it and I would love to help people out. Also, check out our live stream D&D session, Behold This Crit, live every Friday at 7pm EST. We go for about 3 or 4 hours and it is always a hoot. The players are in the midst of a pretty intense battle right now, so uh, be sure to check it out if you get a chance. But with that being said, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this video and I'll see you on Friday.